there's a lot of ground that I want to cover with you, starting with just how you feel about this spring and how you guys are coming along. Yeah, I've been really pleased. I actually just finished our second of uh, three total scrimmages when you include the the red and white game coming up here on uh, April 29th. And uh, really like the way we progressed from the first scrimmage to the one we just had Saturday. I thought it was a lot cleaner, uh, not a lot of penalties. Uh, a lot of young players got some opportunities to to, to go in the shell and, and really perform. And I, I was I really liked the way we came out of Saturday's scrimmage and looking forward to building on it the next couple of practices here before we have our red and white game Saturday. Developing players, developing coaches. This is my transition, Coach, to one of my favorite topics surrounding you, which is the National Coalition of Minority Football Coaches and how that came together. First, though, I need to tell you, I'm a member. I signed up. I'm a part of it. I want to be a part of it. It is really important to me, and we'll talk about why. But some of the guys that you have working with you include Miami Dolphins GM Chris Greer, Ozzie Newsome, my goodness, Nick Saban, Mike Tomlin, Bill Polian, Willie Jeffries, goodness, the first black FBS coach in history. And then, of course, Buddy Pugh, who also gave Deion Sanders the business in the Celebration Bowl, but we We'll get to that a little bit later. Coach, how did this come around and how did you come around to finding it? You know what, RJ, it it was simple. Um, I thought there was a space that was needed. You know, I came into this profession in 1992 and you saw people like John Thompson and Nolan Richardson and and, and those guys really um, helped shape to make the game better for minority coaches. And uh, coming in through the BCA, the Black Coaches Association, as it was known, uh, joining in 1992. And then when I looked up during the pandemic, when we finally, you know, it was the first time in my career where everything paused. There was nothing, uh, no team to coach, no spring ball to get re- ready for. Uh, and it gave me a chance to do some self-reflection and quality control as to where I was in my career. And probably the biggest takeaway was that um, – You know, there wasn't a space or an advocacy group out there like we had when I first got into this profession that could help uh, football coaches, minority football coaches, uh, take the necessary steps to be in the position that I find myself in leading the the University of Maryland football program. And it's just a way of paying it forward. Um, I know I'm on the back nine of the career uh, in coaching. This will be my 32nd year as a full-time Division I coach. And I just thought that it, it was needed to pay it forward to help the next generation of Coach Loxley's coming through the pipe. There are lots of different ways in which you can help younger coaches, experienced coaches get these opportunities, but none is more important to me than walking it like you talk it. And I'm going to just go through it, Coach. You got two black coordinators, right, in Brian Williams and Josh Gaddis, black AD in A.D. Evans, and a black president in Daryl Pines. I don't think there's another university in this country that can claim that, let alone a black head coach and two black coordinators. How has that helped your culture, and how has that helped you advocate for black coaches in the sport? Yeah, you know, and again, I try to practice what I preach, and that's to hire the best available coaches, the best Mm -hmm. possible coaches. You know, a year ago, I had Dan Enos, and I had a chance to work with Dan Enos, who's not, who happens to not be a minority. And so, to me, the opportunity of being able to look and see what's available when it comes to coordinator hirings and is the same way I'd like to see some of these other, you know, especially these NFL owners look at it, is that if there's qualified candidates, uh, black or white, that they have an opportunity. And it just so happened it worked out this way. I can't tell you that I intentionally thought, hey, let's go hire Josh Gaddis and now I'll have two minority coordinators. I went and hired the best available coach and the best coach I thought that would give us the opportunity to move and continue to move the Maryland program forward, um, to have the leadership that we have in Dr. Pines, who uh, was the dean of our engineering school here, uh, uh, to have a guy like Damon Evans, who spent time leading the Georgia Bulldogs program, um, having those type of uh, bosses to lean on when, when, when working through hiring processes has benefited us and, Uh, The University of Maryland has benefited from being able to hire some really good coaches like the coordinators we have and and Brian Williams and Josh Gaddis, as well as our special teams coordinator, James Thomas, who's done a a great job leading our special teams. I'm interested in the hire of Coach Gaddis alongside 
You added Kevin Sullivan when nobody was looking here a little bit earlier in the spring. Two guys that have a reputation like yourself for prolific offense. And what have those coaching conversations been like with those two guys? Yeah, you know, for me, it's all about getting better. And to be able to go out and hire uh, people like Kevin Sumlin and his pedigree and the job he did there at Texas A&M and Houston and having Heisman Trophy candidates and working with great quarterbacks and then it's coached in big games. You know, Josh has come up in the business the right way, having spent time, you know, with James Franklin at Vanderbilt and Penn State under Coach Saban there when I was at Alabama and then working with Jim Harbaugh. As I saw our program and the necessary uh, and, and, and it being necessary for us to take that next step, I thought the next step was finding a way to uh, maybe improve us as coaches in terms of guys that have been in some of these big games. You know, we played Ohio State, Michigan really close, which, again, close is only good in a game of horseshoes. But I thought that there were some things that we could do now when you hire experienced coaches that have been in some of these big games you know, obviously the coaching staff that that helped us build this thing up to where it is today did a really good job of putting down a strong foundation. But when I lost coaches, because, again, when you build a program like we have, other people become interested in the coaches in your program to be able to replace the Dan Enoses, the Mike Millers, the Elijah Brooks with guys like Latrell Scott, who led Richmond to the one uh, double A national championship, Kevin Sumlin who's been and coached in some of the biggest games you can think of the last 10 years in college football. And even the job Josh has done, you know, prior to the Miami situation, you know, a guy that was well-respected enough that he was named Royals award winner, which goes out to the nation's top assistant as an assistant there at Michigan. Um, I feel really good that we've upped the experience level, which I'm hopeful uh, will be the next step for our program is finding ways to win some of these big games. Well, it's an, a really impressive assortment of coaches you got, but also I'm going to point to it, Coach. Gaddis beat Ohio State at Michigan. Uh, Coach Sumlin played at Purdue, right? You right. have guys that, as you mentioned, have played in those big games and have coached in those big games. I'm not going to short Coach Sumlin being my my alma mater, uh, well, not okay. my grad school alma mater at Oklahoma when he was doing great things there. But right. you mentioned playing Mich or Michigan and Ohio State close. And you're I understand horseshoes and hand grenades, but you're that close. What is it that you think you need to do in those games specifically to win them? Yeah, it goes down to getting players to execute in critical situations and, um, you know, the way you prepare. Uh, again, both the guys you named, Josh and Kevin, have, have been in some of these dogfights. And not that the other coaches that I've had hadn't, but I think a clean, fresh perspective of, you know, Kevin having not been in my offensive system, uh, being able to add some elements, you know, when you look and see the things they did at Texas A&M and Houston with the wide open style system. Uh, and then again, Josh's experience of, of being there at Michigan and, and helping them turn that program around and establishing the a physicality in the run game, you know, I think is a great combination in, in addition to what we've already shown uh, the ability to do on offense, but to add their experience, their game planning throughout the week. Uh, you know, a lot of that fell upon just on Dan Enos and, and myself when it came to how we prepared sometimes. I mean, of course, the other coaches were able to to make additions, but to have two guys with experience in the room, when especially when I'm not there, again, I think lends itself that uh, we'll show up and, and put together really good plans this year to to try to help us take the next step that a bunch of coaches have helped us build on. Well, Coach, I'm going to say it out loud. I'm pulling for you for a number of reasons, but not the least of which is there has not been a black head coach to win a national championship. Willie Taggart went on record 2016 saying he wanted to do it first. We would all like to see anybody do it first, but I'm also going to point to one more instance for which I think the coalition is important. We saw 16 vacancies among FBS head coaches, right? Only one was filled by a black head coach, and that would be Deion Sanders down in Colorado. I wonder, do you see any reflection or do you feel any reserve that you can push forward to try to send goodwill their way or any other black head coaches that you come across? Do you feel some kind of way about seeing Dion and being able to do well at Colorado as you do well at Maryland? You know what? I, I like to see us all do really well and, and, and be able to be pillars and, and set the stage for, for opportunities, as I always talk about 
paying it forward for the next generation of, of minority coaches that are coming through the ranks. Uh, we've got to have great success. Um, I, I will say that though there was one hired this cycle at the collegiate level, you look over the last couple of years with guys like Tony Elliott having um, opportunities, Marcus over there at Notre Dame having opportunities, and, and a lot of these guys, uh, Charles Huff at Marshall, a lot of these guys have come through the coalition and the academy uh, that we created uh, where we've taken, um, you know, 12 to 14 coaches that we feel have the stuff and that has been vetted by our organization to where we think they're prepared and ready to lead programs. Um, you see one hire, but I can tell you that the coalition is usually one of the first phone calls made when these job opportunities present themselves, at least in a collegiate level. But what we've got to try to do is figure out this NFL piece because it's been um, – We've been banging on doors and not getting any answers, and, and there's not a lot of uh, of buy-in per se by the decision makers at that level where they're calling, and, and it's not a college organization. Um, we want to help minority coaches from the rec league coach to the NFL coach that, was, that wants to ascend to the role of leading a program. And to me, uh, we still got a lot of work to do but I feel really good of the impact that the coalition has had and will continue to have as we keep pushing this thing forward. Thank you for watching the number one college football show. Please remember to subscribe to the channel and like this video so that you don't miss any of the best college football coverage in America.